Hello everyone and welcome to Jerry's Live. I'm your host Mont Tuman, and tonight we're going to be talking about all about how you can use references to draw things from your imagination. And that might be a little confusing because if you think about drawing from imagination you don't normally think about using references and photos to aid you in doing that but I'm going to talk a little bit on how you guys can do that today or tonight's class. So before I get too far into things I need to mention tonight's class code, which is JL323. If you type that class code, JL323, into the search bar on jerrysartorama.com, it's going to bring up the teacher's cart, where you're going to find all the supplies that we're going to be using tonight. And I've got some like fun and more unusual supplies for tonight's class, if you're unfamiliar with them. So I'm excited to get right into things. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit and explain a little bit more about what the topic of this class is because it's a little more conceptual than some of the things that we do here on Jerry's Live. And what I really want to show you guys is how you can take like an image in your head. You have an idea of something that you want to draw and then find references that you can use to aid that thing that you want to draw rather than catering your illustration or your artwork to those references. You want to cater the references to your illustrations. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, I did want to mention, I believe we are streaming on TikTok and Instagram. So hello to everyone that is watching us there. If you want to see a full screen version of what we have tonight, this is a very small portion of what we have up on the screen. I believe TikTok and Instagram can just see like my sketch pad and me right here. If you want to see the full screen or if you want to ask any questions, head over to our YouTube and our Facebook accounts. There you'll be able to ask questions and you'll be able to see everything that we've going on on our big table here. So without further ado, let's get into things. So I have a few things that we're going to discuss tonight. Um, first thing is this isn't going to be in class on how you can like conceptualize ideas. Uh, I'm going to actually show you guys really quickly if I can get this in screen. This is a painting that I did in my, I'm actually going to move the dry pad so we're not getting confused between these. This is a painting that I did if we go to our overhead um, in my personal time and my goal with this painting was to actually, you can see it pretty well on the camera, was to only use black paints and to make something really really dark so that you can, it's kind of like you're staring out into the night and you can only vaguely see what's there, a little bit of a spooky scene to it, but if you look closely on this, I mean the whole point was that it would be hard to see um, there's a huge raven right here in the middle of the image. And this raven took me a long time to figure out. I even hold it up a bit closer, so maybe you guys can see it better in a little different lighting. Um, that raven took me a long time to figure out. And some of the things that I tried to use to be able to draw this raven the way that I wanted it to was to make a little maquette. So I'm gonna move that out of the way really quickly so you can see this. This is a little tiny clay and paper bird that I made. Uh, I'm going to walk you guys through the steps on how you can make something like this and then use it for a reference. And the reason that I decided to make this specifically for this illustration is that, you know, when I first got this idea, I did a little rough sketch of it and then I went online and I started looking up all different kinds of reference photos of ravens. But the thing is about photographers when they photograph birds, I wanted to have this bird head on coming down into this. So you could just see the silhouette of the wings and then kind of the circular form of the body. But most photographers, when they want to photograph a bird or a raven, they get like a side angle from it, or side view. So you can see that silhouette of the body and the beak. Because like straight on, that body tends to turn into kind of more of a blob shape. It's not as a recognizable silhouette, which is why photographers take photos of them from the side. Um, but since I wanted that straight on view, I knew that I had to create my own reference to use since I'm not the most familiar with bird anatomy and the perspective on these birds can be kind of complicated, I decided I was going to create this in order to get that perspective the way I wanted it to and to create this the way I wanted it rather than trying to find a reference image that vaguely fit what I wanted to see. So the first thing that you're going to want to do once you have the concept of whatever you would like to draw in your mind before you do anything else, before you find reference images or any of that, and I'm actually going to I'm going to move things around a little bit here. So I'm going to move my painting up so we can still see it a little bit. We can have something fun on the screen. <laughs> this little cow <laughs> just watching everyone. Um, the first thing that you're going to want to do when you get a concept in your head, before you go look for reference images, before you start doing anything else, is to just sketch it out. And this sketch can be really ugly. 
It can be have awful perspective. It can have awful proportions. The idea of it is to just get out what you want to see. And this too can be like a small thumbnail sketch. You can do it a little bit larger and a little more detailed if you have really specific details that you wanted it in mind. But the idea is to just start getting down the concept. You know, if I wanted like a bird coming down here, draw it out ugly, you know, feel free to make it look bad and not get too hung up in how it appears. Cause really the purpose of this stage is to just figure out where you want things to be and what you're gonna wanna look for later when you start looking for reference images. So I think when I first started out doing this painting up here, I actually had the bird out of side silhouette, which I decided I didn't want because I wanted kind of this background of mountains behind it and then the cow down below here. I think I literally drew the cow like this in my initial sketch of it and I'll hold it up a little bit for you guys to see. I literally did like the four stick leg things. It was quite literally a scribbly sketch. It wasn't detailed at all. Um, and the idea is this is that I just wanted to figure out what I'm going to need for references. What is going to confuse me and complicate the image for me the most. So just sketching down the concept, knowing what you want in mind so that that comes first. Uh, is really the most important thing. Um, so I had my bird here originally, I had it at a side silhouette, but I, again, I wanted these mountains behind it. I knew I wanted like a moon shining in the background. I actually have, I think the cow and the moon is really the only thing you can really see on this because of there's so much lighter in value. Um, and originally when I had this set up on the side silhouette, I didn't like it as much because I knew this wing would be blocking out a huge portion of the sky and that would make it a little more noticeable. And I wanted it to almost hide in the tree line a little bit, which is why I decided to go for this front facing perspective for the bird. So that's also why it got a little more complicated and got it a little more difficult for me to easily find reference images. So again, coming back to it, just sketch out something rough, sketch out something ugly, figure out what you want your concept to be. Don't rely on reference images. Don't rely on what you think things should look like. Just go by what you want things to look like. Plan that out first. This can be really rough like this. This can be more detailed, but that's really your starting place. And once you have that down, and once you know in your mind what you want your image to consist of, that is when you're gonna start your search for reference images. So I have several references image, blah, 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 reference images here that I'm gonna be working from tonight. I've got four of them printed off. And these were actual reference images that I used for this painting up here. So you can see none of them look anything like how my final painting turns out. This one's probably the most similar, but if you look closely, you can see this is actually a back view of the bird. And I actually used this specific reference image to help create my maquette, which I'll get into later. Um, but a, a note about reference images, if you're looking for them, try to make sure you're using ones that are free use. So I believe our moderators will link these reference images that I found in our chat tonight. Um, but I found these all on unsplash.com and there's a few different websites and places that you can find free for use images, but essentially it's just images that the photographers of these images offered them up for people to use as reference. They didn't put a copyright on them. If you're using an image that has a copyright on it, or if you're not sure if it's free for use, always assume it has a copyright on it. Um, that means that that work and the intellectual property surrounding that image belongs to the photographer. So if you were to use it at all, you might have to pay to pay the photographer, ask the photographer's permission to use it. Um, and if you use one, and this, I should preface here, this is really specifically for if you're going to sell your art in any capacity or make any kind of profit off of it. If you're just using this to sketch for your own use and just to practice, it's okay to just use the image. But if you're selling or making any kind of profit off of things, make sure you're using for use because if someone has a copyright on it, they can claim it as their intellectual property since they you use their photograph for reference. So be careful about that. Do look into copyright laws, especially if you're going to be selling your artwork, but that is something important to keep in mind. But I believe unsplash.com, which is what I use for these reference images, all those are for use. So you're welcome to like type things in and find reference images that are helpful for you. And that's the other thing that I find important about being able to make and create your own references like this and not have to rely too heavily on reference images, be able to just find things with a few key details that you want to point out is because um, while there's millions upon millions of photographs out there on the internet, not all of it is stuff that you can use for your art if you're intending on selling it. So 
always keep that in mind when you're using reference images and it's always good to credit the people that you find reference images for even if you're not like exactly copying them. Okay, so I had these few reference images. Things that I wanted to look for when I was searching for these. Um, when I first sketched this out, I felt like I had a pretty good grasp on the cow. So I did not search for a whole lot of different reference images for this cow because I knew I just wanted it in a pretty standard cow position and it would be a lot easier for me to find reference images for a cow just looking at you. It's pretty simple if you type in online, you know, a cow facing you. I knew that would be easy for me to find because of my experience with searching for reference images. Um, the rest of this background I made up. So it's not a very complicated background. You can see it's just a bunch of layered trees, a tree line, itty bitty mountains in the distance that you can just barely see. And all of that was easy enough for me to come up from my imagination where I knew I wouldn't need reference. So I knew that the raven that I wanted would really be the most complicated part and the thing that I would need the most references for. So when I first started out just looking for reference images, when I realized that I wouldn't be able to find one that exactly matched the pose that I wanted to create, I didn't try to find something that was close enough and just manipulate my drawing to fit that reference image. Instead, what I did is that I found reference images that would help me the most about like things I knew I would specifically get hung up on. So small details and the bird, I made sure I got one with all these close-up details on feathers and specifically what the side profile for the head shape is like. This is also very helpful if you're creating a maquette of any known animals or even like unknown animals but I'll talk about that in a little bit. Having a side profile of what they look like is going to help you a lot. Uh, I knew I wanted to have an image of what the wings and the tail looked like when it was splayed out since I that's how I was depicting my bird so I made sure I got a couple that had the wings like that so this bird has its wings splayed out a bit, this bird has its wings splayed out a bit and this one does as well and the other thing I looked for that was a specific detail was that um, this bird that I've depicted right here is landing, essentially. It's coming down towards the ground. Really, it's gonna pick up this cow. Sadly, poor cow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for abusing this imaginary cow. Um, but I knew that, like, the position of the wings and the tail were going to change depending on how the bird was landing. So if a bird's landing down, they tend to, like, almost turn their wings out at an angle and their tail splays out like this so that they're able to catch that, we that wind and slow down. So I specifically looked for reference images where the bird was right about to land so that I would be able to capture that feeling accurately. If I just found reference images where the bird was flying midair, I might not be able to capture like the characteristics of this raven as well. So those are a few key things to keep in mind when you're looking for reference images. Um, one thing that I did not look for when I found these references is lighting. And the reason, I mean, you can probably guess already why I wasn't too concerned with that because you, there's really no lighting on my bird up here. Um, so I wasn't really concerned with finding a really specific light angle. And it's really hard to find that in references, something that's lit perfectly the way you want it to. In fact, I believe a really helpful class that we can look for, that you can look for if you want more information on drawing things mm. from your imagination is our intro to illustration class. And I actually talked a lot in that one about how I was struggling to get a specific lighting that I wanted on a man's face and how I kind of dealt with that. So if you want more information about that, that is where you will find it. Um, but when I was thinking about lighting and how I wanted things set up, that's really well this little maquette that I made came in handy. And I'm gonna talk you guys through how I created this. So this is a little bit of thin wire that I had. If you're going to do this, what I have in the class, the teacher's cart is known as armature wire, which is a bit thicker but it's sturdier, it's gonna help your maquette stay up a bit more. You can see as soon as I pick this up, it's bobbing all the way around. So that thin wire might not be the most helpful for you, especially if you're doing something that's larger than this, because this is a fairly small maquette. You can see it's not even as big as my hand. It's really tiny. So that thick wire is gonna give you a lot more sturdiness to it. Um, and armature is really the base that you wanna start out on, no matter what you're trying to create. Um, and we actually sell some pre-made armature. So this right here, if you're making a person for your character, this is a uh, Creative Mark armature. They have it in a little guy as well as in uh, just a ball, which I think you can sculpt into a head if you want just the head of a person. Um, and the handy thing about this is one, dealing with armature wire and trying to get it specifically the way you want it to can be quite complicated. 
I'm not going to get too much into that tonight because it's really a whole nother show that we can talk about. So if you want a whole nother show about that, let us know in the chat and we'll see if we can figure that out. Um, for this bird right here, the wire that I have, it's really a straight up wire and then just a little ball of it at the top. Since I knew this would be, this is going to be, I knew it would be small and I knew since birds are pretty thin and small, I wouldn't have too much buildup up here. So I knew the wire would be able to support it even if it was just a small little ball. Uh, I believe I actually continued the wire up into the wings to give them a little bit of structure so I could bend them the way they are bent. Um, but armature is really the place you want to start when you're creating your own maquettes. And I want to point out too, the reason this right here is twisted the way it is, is so when you apply clay to it, because that's what this is for, it's for building clay on top of, that clay is going to have a little bit of grip. So I believe they do this with a drill. If you take a drill, you would wind two strands of this around each other to be able to get that twisted effect. It gives a bit more structure and allows the clay to grip onto it better. So that's something you want to be mindful of when you're creating your maquette. Uh, in tonight, tonight's class, we are using air dry clay. You don't need anything fancy to create your maquettes. They can be really simple and rough and ugly as long as they get the information that you want across. I'm going to pull this out of the bag so you can actually see what it is. This is air dry, air dry clay, so it will dry out if I just leave it out. I have it wrapped up in a couple layers of saran wrap and then in a baggie. I recommend that if you're using air dry clay, uh, don't just leave it out because this package, as soon as you tear into it, is not going to let it dry properly. You can see if I open this up, I'm going to end up getting clay on my hands doing this. Uh, this is the clay that I also used to make this maquette, so I've had it open for a little over a month now, and staying wrapped up in the saran wrap in the bag kept it from drying out. So if you're using any of this, make sure you do that. I believe keeping it in a refrigerator might also help slow the drying time if you're really concerned about it, but just keeping it in a bag in like an airtight-ish area should help you a lot. So a few tips for using this air dry clay uh, if you've never used it before. Again, I didn't actually end up using much of it on here. What I did for this one specifically is that I actually took watercolor paper and I specifically used New York Central watercolor paper that I have in the teacher's cart there. Um, but I took that and I drew out what just the wings and the tail would be flat. I didn't try to draw them out in perspective or anything. I just drew out the actual anatomy of the wings and tail on a piece of paper and tried to keep it as flat as possible. And that's where I used this as reference for how those feathers would lie. And I believe if you're doing specifically a bird, they have lots of different diagrams about how feathers lay and everything like that, that you can use that are super, super useful. So if you're doing a bird, I recommend you check that out. But I literally just did wings and tail and the center of the body here. I didn't even try to do the head. I marked that out on watercolor paper, cut it out. And then once I had that cut out, I took a little bit of clay and a little bit of glue. And you'll see in the teacher's car, I actually have matte medium as our glue. So matte medium can work really well as a glue because it has acrylic polymer that really likes to stick to itself. So that's what I used for this. Um, to stick it onto the base of my wire, which again was just a bundled up piece of wire. And then around that is where I applied clay. So you can see if I bring this up closer, that the only parts that are clay is this back part right here and these muscles on the side leading up into the wing. The head is made out of clay, the beak's made out of clay, and then this lower body on the bottom here is all clay, as well as the legs. These little nubby legs that I put in, which actually are not long enough in proportion to the bird. If you see from my reference images over here, how long, if I hold this up without any glare, how long these bird's legs can actually get. I just made them short because I knew that I could figure out the rest of this anatomy easily enough in my final illustration, so I wasn't as concerned about that. Um, but if you're concerned about getting the perspective right on these legs, build your maquette a little bit larger so that you can fit those legs in and you can see this tiny little wire bops it around everywhere. And then the last thing I did, once the clay had hardened, make sure it hardens properly, is that I painted over it. Uh, and. When I was thinking about lighting in this image, again, I wasn't really concerned with lighting because I knew I wanted it to be super, super dark. So what I decided to do is paint it a matte black color. There's a few different colors that you can paint your maquette. Well, we've got my head in the shot there. Um, I have a few examples here and I actually want to bring in 
a really important tool that you can use for creating your maquettes, which is this lamp, this ColorView Lux lamp. Uh, I just have the head of the lamp right here. Here, I'll put it in the middle for everyone on TikTok and Instagram to see. It's not lit up right now, obviously. They do come with tripods. If you need a tripod, I just have the head of it right here so that it's easy for me to move around on camera and show you on this desk. Uh, they do come with tripods though if you need one. And the thing that makes these really important is being able to figure out exactly what your lighting is on your subject. So I need to, I need to backtrack a little bit because I realized there was some information that I didn't include at the beginning. But um, this technique that I'm showing you guys is really a very, very old technique. So a lot of you might be wondering like, why should I do this and not just do 3D modeling digitally? And 3D modeling is essentially the modern equivalent of doing this. Uh, but this is a very old master technique, is creating little maquettes to be able to use for reference when they didn't have photo references to use. And it's a technique that a lot of illustrators still use today. If any of you have heard of James Gurney, he's really, really well known for creating little maquettes like this to use for his references. He is a paleontological illustrator, I believe I said that right. Um, so he creates lots of dinosaurs, which obviously we don't have photo references for, so he will use maquettes for it. I believe Jim K is an, another really well-known illustrator, if any of you, I believe he illustrated the Harry Potter books, if any of you have seen those, who also uses maquettes to be able to do it. And one reason that you want to have a maquette like this, if you're doing repeated imagery, like James Gurney was doing his Dinotopia books, and then obviously Jim K did the Harry Potter books, they were using the same references over and over and over again, and they needed to have them at different angles and in different lightings. So they created physical things that they could use to manipulate that and use it over and over and over again, rather than searching constantly for different reference images. I think that's the thing that we often forget as artists is that rarely does anyone draw something completely from imagination. People do, but everyone uses references all the time. I do, Emmy does constantly. They're really an important tool for artists and they're one that people have always used. Even back when you think that, oh, they didn't have photography then or they didn't have ready resources, they might not have been using as many references. They were. They had actual people coming in. They were creating actual small maquettes like this. So that's part of the reason why I wanted to show you guys how to do this because this is really a very old technique that I think still holds true today. And again, you might be wondering how this is any different from just creating a 3D model online. And it's not really. It's a, Doing that is a very helpful tool if you have the resources to do so. If you don't, then this is really a very easily accessible thing. You don't have to be great at sculpting to do this. Again, I just drew these out and cut them. It didn't actually create, I think it took me like half an hour to make this. So this was very fast and fairly easy, even if you have not worked in clay before, as I'm not a sculptor, a sculptor. I haven't worked with a lot of clay, but again, it was like getting the wings right was the most important and hardest part. And then just putting a ball for the body and one for the head and a triangle for the beak. And I was good to go. And this was like enough for me to be able to figure out that complex perspective and that silhouette that I wanted on this bird. Uh, so yes, that is really what I want to talk about. And there is a bit of a difference. If I move on here, I should start showing you guys this lamp because I know I'm doing a lot of talking and not a lot of showing which is good in some ways, but also a little boring in others. So I have my lamp here. I should say this is a very high powered lamp that's really meant to be used from a distance. And I'm using it really close on right here. So I'm gonna keep it at a low setting. Uh, but the reason I wanted to show you guys this lamp, let me see, I have to turn it on. That's the problem here. So this is a fairly low setting. You can already see how bright that is. And if I move this around in space, you can start to see how different shadows and different highlights start to appear on this bird. So I just remembered that I forgot to go back to my explanation on why I painted this bird matte black. And the reason why I did that, I see that looks pretty cool. Uh, I didn't just use matte black paint for starters. I actually have a shiny glossy lame paint on this as well. I'll get into why I did that in a second. But you can see I have a little example here of three small clay spheres that I did. This is one is not painted. This is directly the color of the clay that I have in the teacher's cart. It's just straight white clay. And then these two, this one is painted with matte, matte black paint acrylic. And then this one is a regular acrylic. So it's not a glossy acrylic. It's just a typical regular acrylic. I should have put probably one more layer on it cause, so you can see the white peeking through a little bit, but it works no matter what. You can see as I put these into our light, 
and I might hold this up a little bit better for you guys to see as well, how the matte black one, you really can't see any highlights on it. You can't see very much shadows on it. it. You can't even really see a lot of reflected color on it. So I have this set on a cool setting right now. So I'm getting a lot of blue light shining on it. Um, but the regular acrylic, you start to see a little bit of a blue shine on it. And the white one, especially, you get a lot of that strong highlight and a bit of that blue glinting on it. This is something you want to think about when you're making your maquette. What the sheen of whatever you're trying to create has and what the texture of it has. So since I knew I wanted to create something that had very little highlights and very little shadows and blended in a lot with a black background, I knew I wanted to go the matte category. Which makes things a lot harder to see in terms of details. I mean, you guys can see right here how difficult this is to see just against this background. It kind of already blends in. That's part of the reason why I put this LeMay paint on it, which is actually, it has glitter in it, essentially. Uh, is because I knew I wanted at least a little bit of that shiny raven wing that you kind of get with having a little bit of blue and purple glitter on there. So that's why I did that. Also, it looks cool and it's fun and I enjoyed doing it. It made it fun to do. It looks cool. I'm like, I could put this on my desk as a little display. This, that's a piece of tape that I have there on the back. I had put in, if I set this down, I put in this little, this is all foam that I've just glued this on top of to have a base. I put this foam thing on there as a indication of where the tree line should be. So when I was trying to plan out exactly what pose I wanted, I could get an idea of where the tree line would be in reference to it. So that's why that's there and I just have it taped on the back because I knew I wouldn't have to see that part when I was setting this up. But yeah, if you want something that comes off more realistically in light and you're concerned about color, painting it, whatever the local color is, and local color essentially is the literal color that it is. So if you have an orange and it's orange, and then that is the local color is orange. And then if you put that orange thing into under like a blue light, it's actually going to look really gray. So that's something you have to keep in mind is what is the actual color you're painting and then how your light is going to affect that. And that is something that your maquette can help you figure out. So I painted these black just because we're working with a black bird, but painting these whatever color you want your final image to be. If you're painting an orange cat, having your maquette be orange might be super helpful. If you're painting something with stripes or with multiple colors, painting it that actual color is going to be helpful for you if color is an important part in your process and something that you specifically need to have references for. Maybe color isn't something you're too hung up on. Maybe it's light and it's the direction that the light is coming and how shadows affect your, ref your maquette is more important to you for whatever you are drawing then you might want to go the white route and you can see I actually just painted this right before the show. The paint is coming off in my hand. So apologies for that. I got a little bit on my white one right here. Um, so I'm just going to put that down so I don't keep spreading paint everywhere. But if you're more concerned with how light is affecting your maquette, if you had a really dramatic sunlight, if you have a really intense light showing on it, or even just a really small rim light, if your light's coming from behind and only seen on the edge and you're concerned about how to capture that and you're not sure Leaving your maquette white, like the color of the clay that I put in the teacher's card is, or painting it as such, if you've got a different type of clay that you're using, is going to be the most helpful for you because different colors and different lightings are going to show up on a white base a lot easier than other colors. So again, this is how you can start to customize your maquette for what your needs are in terms of references and what you want to be able to see. You can paint it realistically, you can leave it just plain white if you just want to see how shadows and light are affecting it. Or again, if you're not concerned about shadows and light at all and you want it to try and blend into the background like I did here, which I guess is a little bit unusual, then maybe matte black is the thing that you want to do. So these are some things to consider. I got paint in my hands. I think it's fine though. That won't rub off on anything else. Sure. <laughs> okay, so putting those off to the side. I think it's time that we start playing around with this and actually try to draw something. Um, so I am going to be using, I'm going to set up a pose different than the one I have in my painting right here because I want a little bit of a challenge, you know, I want to show you guys how you can do this on the spot and how you can work it out. Uh, I'm going to use my maquette in combination with my reference images that I have in order to draw a attempt at a realistic looking raven just from the resources that I have available to me. So. Do we have, let me know in the chat right now if there are any preferences for what pose you want this bird to be in. I know that's really specific and hard to explain over chat. I do want to know. 
I can do a lot of different things. I could do a straight side profile, which might be a little bit boring to us. So maybe not that. I could do like maybe a three quarters angled. This is gonna be hard because my view of this and your view of this on the camera is slightly different. So I'm gonna say if on the camera, if it looks like this, you know, say if you want it. <laughs> um, I could do, I don't wanna do straight down or straight on or anything like that because I think that wouldn't be enough of a challenge. <laughs> I wanna do something that's slightly challenging or a slightly strange angle. So, you know, I can really show you guys how to utilize this to the best of its abilities. So maybe I'll go with that angle there where we're seeing a little bit of this underwing, a little bit of the top of the other wing here, and then we're getting the tail and a little bit of the beak and head. Okay, so again, this is a really rough and quick maquette. Actually, I'm gonna show you guys this a little bit closer so you can get an idea of just how, uh, I'll even hold up that white paper behind it <laughs> since it's so dark, just how, you know what? I should be using the light. Simple this is, it really is just clay chunked onto the bottom. I did try to pay attention a little bit to bird anatomy. So building up that musculature on the other underside of the wing and trying to get on the top here, again, that little bit of musculature leading into the tail and on the side of the wings there was important to me. Uh, one thing I found that was a problem with this maquette that I ended up struggling with is the shape of the head. Uh, on this, I ended up doing a really rounded head but the actual head shape for most ravens is pretty squared off. So that's something I ended up struggling with when I went into my final drawing here. Um, so I think we're gonna do a little bit of a back angle. Did anyone have any preferences in the chat? Yes, Frida. YouTube asks for, and I quote, flying down to attack breakfast. <laughs> oh, so did Facebook, diving for food. Diving for food, okay, so we're gonna do it coming down, so I'm gonna get, have to get at a low angle and maybe even tilt it up a bit and able to see that. I mean, this is, that's essentially the pose that we had over here, but I'm gonna tilt it in a different way so that we don't get exactly what I had in this painting because that's not as fun. <laughs> okay, so maybe we want kind of a twisted view like that. So we get, look at that crazy shape that the wing is starting to create. This is something that I would find incredible difficulty creating for my imagination is how funky that back wing looks. And that's why these maquettes are really so valuable. And I really don't see any of the form of the body in this. Okay, so maybe, I, I don't wanna try and hold this while I'm drawing, cause that would be difficult, but I'm gonna try and set this. Maybe I'll use my clay. I'm gonna try to use my clay right here. Um, uh, I'm gonna try to get this in frame for people on Instagram and TikTok. But again, if you wanna be able to see the whole table and everything that we're doing, please go over to Facebook and YouTube in order to see it, because this might be an area where you're missing out a bit, because it's gonna be hard for me to get this exactly how I want it to be. Okay. I think something like that. Okay, so I'm gonna be working from my viewpoint rather than the cameras, because it's easier for me to see. Um, so you guys can kind of see what I'm looking at here, but my view is gonna be slightly different, and I'm gonna nudge that up a bit. That's a lot of messy um, stuff there for anyone looking at the smaller screen. But we got ready to go here. And again, I'm not just going to be using my maquette. I'm really going to be using it in tandem with the reference images that I have printed out here. So I can get more of those little details and things like that. So I have my bird here. I have the whole base of it's kind of blocking my view. So I got to stand on my tippy toes a little bit. And I'm just going to start getting down the proportions and everything like that. So I'm gonna draw the head out as a circle even though I know I'm gonna to have to change that later. Uh, I'm gonna to try to get basically just the perspective of it down. Perspective is something that is incredibly useful when you're drawing from your imagination and we have a lot of classes on it now. I think we've done three different classes on perspective drawing. So I did one on intro to, perspe intro to perspective drawing, an advanced perspective drawing class, and then I also had one on drawing people in perspective. If you guys want to look at any of those, perspective is kind of your bread and butter when you're just starting out to draw things from your imagination. I'm going to come down and I'm going to try to just draw out the general shape of the wing rather than getting all those details in. My sketch is going to overlap. Actually, I'm going to erase this so we don't see as much of it. If you guys have any questions in the chat, right now would be a great time to ask them while I'm just sketching this out and I don't have to think about everything I need to remember to tell you. <laughs> so I'm gonna erase that. It's gonna be on view a little bit as we're doing this. 
but I just want to show you guys how I can get this is the general shape of the wing that I have down here and then I'm seeing a lot of the underside of this bird so I'm trying to again simplify this into simplified forms I'm not trying to get every little detail and that's part of the reason these maquettes can really help you when you just keep them simple this leg is kind of sticking out a bit at an angle and then the other one I can see behind it is extending down a bit further Again, I have to make these shapes more complicated and more detailed as I go. And then the tail feathers of this bird, I have to lean up a little bit. Let me know if I'm getting into the camera. Uh, the tail feathers of this bird curve down in a really interesting way. So that it's really just a rounded shape, as you guys saw. But that rounded shape takes on a really interesting form when it's manipulated in perspective. So the feathers on this side look a lot shorter because we're seeing them more face on, right? And then the feathers on this side look a lot longer since they're curving away from us. Okay, so that's kind of that back tail, how it's starting to look. And then the wing over here is really the funkiest looking one. So I don't think, it doesn't really start until the center of my head over here. Again, apologies I couldn't get this further into view, but my sketch pad would be like half off the table if I did that. So apologies to anyone on the smaller screens right now, but I'm just going to try and get just a rough idea of where those longer feathers are sticking out and then how it kind of comes back into space towards the body right there. And this is my preliminary sketch that I've taken from this maquette. And the light that's shining on it is something important to take into consideration too how that light's coming in, but I'm going to try to put a little bit more details into this before I come back to my maquette to figure out how the lighting is affecting it. So for this, I'm looking at my reference images. I'm switching from looking at my maquette over to looking at my reference images so I can start to find details like the actual shape of the head, which I told you guys was not accurate in my maquette and something that I should have paid more attention to that ended up being important. So I'm going to look at the beak here. And ravens have this really long kind of pointy beak at the end but it's still fairly square when it comes to the base of it and it's a pretty flat beak as well and they have little tufts of hair that come down on the top of their beak over here so I'm gonna just suggest at that right now suggest at those little tufts that are sticking out and then I'm gonna make sure that I have the bottom side of their head or like the bottom of their jaw right here as flatter than I have it on my maquette because again, this is a little detail that I did not pick up when I was creating it. Bringing that down, and then I'm going to try to get the shape of the top of the head, which is again much flatter than I created it. So I'm going to have that stick up and flatten out. And ravens, what I noticed from my reference images is that they essentially almost have a triangular form on the tops of their heads, but the way I have my perspective set up right now it's actually so that we're not really seeing any of the top of this bird's head. We're seeing a lot of the underside though. So maybe this little tuft of hair that I had drawn out as the side of this bird's beak, we wouldn't see nearly as much of that as I had originally drawn. So I'm gonna go back here and correct that so that it's peeking on the top of the bird's beak, but I'm not seeing as much of the side of it. So I might even grab my eraser again and erase that so I don't get confused by it later, right? So I'm keeping in mind, I'm seeing a lot of the underside of this bird. I'm trying to get that perspective correct, correct. <laughs> my accent's coming out, my Southern accent's coming out. Um, the other s underside of this bird's nozzle, if I'm just looking at the side profile here, has little tufts of hair, um, not hair, feathers, a lot sooner up in it, sooner up in it. I'm great with descriptive words, guys. Um, they appear a lot earlier than in the chest, so I'm going to indicate a few of those right here. I'm not getting into extreme details right yet. I'm just sketching them out as they lead down into the body and the neck. And as you can see from our profile, which I'm going to pull this... I'll, there's a lot of these smaller feathers on the front of the body and near the chest than there is in the back where we get into the wings. That's where the larger feathers really start. So I'm focusing on this area right now since we're seeing a lot of it in our perspective drawing right here. So I'm just going to hint at those tiny little feathers, just with tiny little sketchy lines right now. I'm not going to do anything complicated with detail yet. This again, this is really just a sketch. If you get through your sketching phase 
and you find all your reference images and then you don't know where to go. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's really helpful if you go check out that intro to illustration class because I kind of walk you guys through how to plan out your composition and how to tackle that composition in terms of lighting and hue and all of that. So if you find all your reference images, you've gotten past this point and you're struggling, that's where you should go. But I've had it hinted out very roughly that these feathers here, I'm suggesting to myself that these feathers are a lot smaller. So again, I'm gonna try and get this, this part of the feathers. We can almost see a bit of a triangle right here where those feathers from the front of the chest and those feathers on the back of the chest are separating and they're differentiating from each other. So I'm gonna try to suggest a little bit of that thinking about the perspective on my bird, that it would be higher up since we're seeing more of the underside of it. Uh, it would come almost like this. We'd see a bit of it curving around the top. And then, because the base of our wing is really landing right about here, where that musculature is. And something that I didn't, wasn't able to find in a lot of my reference images is what the underside of the wing looks like. I believe I actually searched for reference images of other types of birds to get an idea of what the anatomy looked like for that. But since I didn't have an exact reference, I didn't want to show you guys one. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to my maquette for this wing anatomy and try to just suggest that a little bit. And a lot of birds, one of my favorite things about birds is that they have this really long feathers at the end that stick out like splayed fingers when you look at them, when, especially when they're landing and they're trying to catch all of that air. So I'm gonna try to, I might actually, I'm gonna move my maquette up and out of the way it's just getting in our way at this point. But I gotta tilt it down so I can still see what I'm looking at. Okay, so these feathers are kind of sticking out and splaying out. This is another complicated part of this raven's anatomy that I don't think I'd be able to get accurately just thinking about it from animation, from imagination, not animation. And from finding reference images too, it's also something, these finger-like feathers that are sticking out here are really difficult to find references for. So I'm gonna suggest those feathers in there. Uh, wings tend to have a little bit of a break in them between those more finger-like feathers and the base of the wing. So I know I'm gonna have more rounded feathers coming down into the body of the wing down here. And I believe actually on the under underside of most birds, they have a thicker portion of feathers on the inside. So I'm gonna hint at that a little bit. You know, maybe I'll kind of suggest the curve of these feathers coming in. Again, nothing crazy. And suggest right here the differentiation between the body of this bird and this wing that's coming up. And then I'm gonna to try to move down here into the legs, which get a bit more complicated. Again, right here in my maquette, I made these legs very short and stubby, but they're actually a lot longer on ravens. And I learned that from really looking at my reference images very carefully. So I'm gonna make sure I have this right here I'm gonna make sure I lengthen these. And looking at references of ravens, I also learned that their hips come up pretty far on their body. So I just had these stubby little things basically sticking directly out of the bo bottom of this bird, which is really not how legs work. Um, they really start from the hips and continue down. So I have to think more about where this bird's hips would be, which would be a bit higher than I have them indicated in my maquette. And really they probably wouldn't be as um, I guess emphasized on that on the actual bird would be a bit more subtle. But they really do end kind of in a very boxy. It's almost like they're wearing shorts. If I look at this reference image right here that I have, it's almost like he's wearing a pair of shorts before the ends of his legs come down. So I'm gonna imagine that when I'm drawing this. And I know that the bottom of this leg is sticking out towards us a little bit. So I'm gonna make sure when I draw that tube of the little tiny leg coming down that I see a lot of the end of it. Okay, and then I'm just gonna suggest that the claws, I'm not gonna do anything crazy for them just cause I feel like that would be too much detail for us to get in for just our preliminary sketch that we're doing. And even that, I realize there's a bit of a joint between this part of the leg and the foot. If I try to do that a bit more detailed Okay, there's another okay, very basic foot that we have coming down on here. And this is actually a fairly awkward angle for this leg's bird to be at 
which again is what I missed out in my maquette. And if I'd gone back and I redid this maquette, that's something that I might pay more attention to because you can see already that I'm struggling to get that angle on the leg correct. So think about in advance what you're specifically gonna struggle with and plan for that. So I would make the head a bit more square. I would make sure I've made this maquette big enough where the support structure for the legs would be able to hold these tiny little nubbins so I could get the perspective correct on them. Those are things that you really wanna pay attention to when you're creating little maquettes like this. So I'm gonna try to get our other leg, which this one has kind of covered a bit. Uh, and really, I saw a bit more, it was coming down kind of like this. And I know from perspective that I'll, it'll come down a little bit farther than this one right here and end a little bit farther. I'll start drawing that leg out. And maybe I'll even try to get this one more at an angle so it looks a little less funky. And I'm just, you know, suggesting it. This isn't going to be a final drawing for anything that I'm doing. It's just trying to get to the stage where you're comfortable enough with the perspective and the silhouette and the form of your drawing that, that you could then move on to a more complicated painting or illustration. So I got this set down and I'm going to get a bit into these back tail feathers here, look, which ended up being pretty complicated. And I know that birds, when their body kind of leans into their tail feathers, it almost ends in a kind of triangular point where that musculature ends. So I'm going to hint at that a bit, even though it wouldn't be that emphasized. This is very much a chicken body that we got going right here in the actual raven's body. But I'm going to make sure I know that that anatomy is there for my sketch. I'm going to start trying to get the perspective on these tail feathers, right? And these are really coming towards me, so they're going to look a bit more like that. And I want you guys to know that there's a lot of different things that you can do with these maquettes. I mean, obviously you can figure out lighting and structure and perspective like I am right now. But you can also do things like figure out how they're going to reflect into a body of water. Like a lot of what James Gurney does, I said earlier, is um, images of extinct species and dinosaurs and things like that. And sometimes if he's doing something where he wants to get a dinosaur illustrated and have it reflecting in the water, you can actually take your little maquette outside, see what it looks like in natural light, and even take it to like a little pond or something like that and set it on the edge and see how it's reflecting in the water and how that reflections perspective works. You know, you can really go far with it. You can take it outside and put it in a little mossy field and get like the feel of what the actual environment might look like if you're creating something, especially imaginary or extinct species. That's something that can be super helpful for a lot of people. And a tip too, if you're creating anything that's not an actual, um, current species or an imaginary species that you're creating, one thing that's helpful is still to look to real life species for that. So I know people who draw dragons, a lot of them will use deers as a reference for the shape of the head or alligators or other, you know, reptiles and things like that. Um, something that I used to do, I used to volunteer at a anatomy and morphology lab. Uh, and one of the things that I did there was do research into, I guess, extinct species, including dinosaurs and paleontology. Yes, I'm tilting over the screen. Thank you for letting me know, guys. I'm trying to see my maquette a bit better. I'll just tilt it up so I can see with my hand. Um, but we had to create artwork, essentially, of an extinct dinosaur species. I don't see might have not even been a dinosaur, but I'm using the term dinosaur for simplification. Uh, so we looked for reference images of current species to base it off of, because we were doing a bit of photo bashing, if you guys are familiar, which is just taking essentially stock photos and manipulating them into the species that we wanted to depict. And so for these dinosaur species, one of them was very feathery. And so we found lots of ducks and different birds with super fluffy white feathers for what we wanted to depict. And then the other one was fairly sc scaly. So we were looking for turtles and birds and other reptiles about what those scales would look like, like around the eye. We found specific examples of what we thought might work for that um, to use as references. So when you're creating your own sh species, that's a really hard word for me to say. I'm trying to put an H into it for some reason. When you're creating your own imaginary creatures, looking from real life examples is extremely helpful. Um, and doing this kind of process where you're finding images you're creating your own maquette for it is going to help you a lot and be able to capture how to make that creature feel real. Okay, so I got 
a very rough sketch drawn out here. I've really used my maquette to the extent of his ability for the profile. I'll come back to it for lighting in a second, um, but I'm going to look for smaller details like the placement of the eye. Again, in perspective, this head, I'm seeing more of the underside of it, so if I try to draw out where I think the eye would be, it would be more towards the top of the head there. And I'm going to draw it out, it's going to be more of a slightly oblong sphere that I'm going to try to get out. So maybe it's like that, and even that might be too low down in terms of how the perspective is. That's the other thing, don't be afraid to put like googly eyes and things like that on this. <laughs> if you want to get an image of what the eyes actually going to look like, I've seen tons of people do that before. Um, so maybe the eyes even set up a bit higher like that. And again, this is a very crude sketch. We're not going to get anything particularly pretty looking today, but I just want to show you guys how you can begin the process. And even if I'm looking at the perspective of this right now and the proportions of it right now, I can already tell that the head's too small for the body. And maybe the body is even, even a little bit too large. If I'm looking at my other references here, I can see on this one how that head really curves straight into the body and the body appears a lot flatter. But since I had used spherical shapes in my maquette, it's not going to look quite like that. So I might even come back here and try to flatten this down, make him look a bit scrawnier and thinner than he was. So that is my rough sketch of the bird. From there, there, I would want to start. <laughs> Amanda's laughing at me now. She's like a fire. My funny, funny <laughs> accent is really coming out. Okay, from there, I'd want to start thinking about lighting. So another helpful thing about this Color View Lux lamp that I have here is that you're able to change warm versus cool, as well as adjust how bright and how dark it is for what you want. Again, I'm keeping it on its lowest setting right now because it gets extremely bright and it'd wash out everything that we'd have on camera if I turned it up to the max. But it does switch between warm and cool depending on what effect that you want. I believe when I first started doing this and I was trying to figure out if I wanted any kind of highlighted feathers or anything cast from the moon, I was using a cool light because I knew it was going to be a very dark spooky feel and I wanted things to feel cold. So that is something to keep in mind when you're adjusting this. Um, if you're going outside and you're using natural light to figure this out, see, so let me get this back in the position that it was with my lamp so that I can try to get the lighting on this while I'm talking. Something to keep in mind is that when it's early in the morning, the light tends to be fairly cool looking outside. And then when it's later at night around dawn and dusk, dawn, no, when it's dawn, it's cool. When it's dusk, it starts to be a bit warmer. So if you're looking for a very specific type of lighting, uh, it's easiest to get a lamp so that you can adjust it manually at any time, day or night. But if you are going outside and using that lighting, that's a thing you want to keep in mind, is that that lighting is going to change throughout the day. And I'm just going to try to figure out where my shadows are and where my highlights are on this bird. So the bottom of this bird's beak and its jaw and then this area of the tail is really picking up the most light where I have the lamp positioned right now. <coughs> So I'm just going to do some very quick rough shading to get that in. You'll see I, in the excuse me thumbnail image that I had for this class, I actually used watercolors for this. You can use whatever medium is your preference. You can use acrylics, you can use oils if you want. Whatever is you're going to feel most confident for your sketching phase in, whatever you would like to do it in. Um, whatever works for you, works for you, you know. Uh, I'm just sketching in with this pencil since this is a black bird. I'm not too concerned about how color is affected since I kind of know already how's it, how it's going to look and how I'm going to use color to depict it. So I'm going to make sure I get very rough this wing. And this wing is further back in space than the rest of this bird, so I might even come in here and shade it, shade it in a bit darker because things that are darker tend to appear a bit farther away from us. This is a... There's a lot of exceptions to this rule, keep that in mind, but if I'm just doing some very basic shading like this, I can already tell that this wing is not picking up a lot of light. And again, we're looking for rough and ugly right now. We're not looking for perfect. This is like helping us figure out our problems. It's not um, getting a perfect drawing just from doing this. And you could use a maquette to depict about just about anything, right? Like you could yeah. do buildings or flowers or just yeah. like anything that you want to be able to see mm -hmm. how the lighting affects. Yeah, anything that you would like, you can do this with. Um, I will say birds, and this bird in particular, was fairly easy to sculpt out because it's 
the body of birds tend to be just like big rounded forms and then wings I just used from paper. Uh, the more complicated forms you get, the better you'll have to get about creating armature and filling those forms out, which again, if you guys are interested in having a class on that, we could have a whole class on that because it is yeah. a lot to talk about. Is that a yes? Okay, cool. We'll see if we can fit it in the schedule. So I'm getting this next wing up here and it's getting a little bit more light on it, but there's not any strong highlights. Again, I'm doing some very rough shading. You'll see right here, I'm using my wrist to do that. I don't recommend you do that, especially if you're doing a lot of drawing and I shouldn't even be doing that. I'm setting a bad example. That's how you get carpal tunnel. I have carpal tunnel. I've struggled with it for years. So doing this kind of motion with your wrist rather than drawing from your shoulder is gonna give that. And if you draw from your elbow instead of your shoulder, you might get tennis elbow. So warning. Uh, it's something I should have been told a lot sooner, but I'm trying not to move my arm too much so I don't bump my lamp over here, so that's partly why I'm doing it. So I'm just gonna get roughly in the value of this bird's wing. Um, but yes, as I was saying earlier, you can create anything with these maquettes. Whatever you can imagine, you can create with clay and paper and wire, essentially. These that's why these maquettes are so useful, is that they'll be able to fill in information that photographs that you find online will not be able to do. I'm trying to get the perspective of this tail down. It's picking up a little bit of light on the inside, but it's not getting as much reflected light as the body is up here. Okay, and this is my very, very rough and quick sketch of this raven. So yeah, there we go. Um, this again, I could make a lot more detailed. I could smooth out the shading here because it's very much not, it's still a very two dimensional form. Um, that's the other thing that having an actual maquette in front of you that you can manipulate is beneficial. Um, more beneficial in terms of having a 3D model that you're looking at on your screen because it helps you think a bit more three dimensionally. So. That's part of the reason why I'm using these two things in accompaniment with each other. Not just because I need to get all the little details and everything like that, but because if you only draw from photographs, you're only drawing what is essentially an already flattened image. It's a little bit of an aid to you already, which sounds confusing, but if you draw from life, you'll start to see a bit better how forms actually turn in space. You'll also have a better grasp for perspective and how shading and everything can happen. It seems strange because you think a camera is able to capture things exactly, but cameras are actually already manipulating the image before you even see it. If you're looking through a camera's lens rather than just looking through your eyes, the image is already being manipulated to some extent, which is why seeing things from life can be super beneficial for depicting realism because you're able to figure out what you want to manipulate in terms of its perspective and its angles, and you're not letting the camera do that for you, which is part of the reason why photography is its, its whole own art because their the photographers are really manipulating the camera and getting the camera to work the way they want because there is a bit of a separation there between what they're seeing and what the camera is actually showing them yes we had a question Frida we do can you tell us about the pencil that you're using yeah so this is a mechanical pencil it has a two milliliter lead in it so it's super super thick um, I'm not actually sure if I put this in the teacher's cart now that I think about it. We're fixing it. Okay, thank you. They're putting it in the teacher's cart right now if you were looking for it. But this is a mechanical pencil with a really thick two millimeter lead. This is more similar to um, hard solid pencils than typical mechanical pencils because the lead isn't as thin. So you can actually even, if you wanted to get a blade and shave this down to be really long, you could and you can if you want to be able to shade on the side of it, you could also do that to some extent. So it's a really helpful mechanical pencil. It was what I was using to sketch tonight. Highly recommend if you guys get this, try mechanical pencils with really thick leads in them. They're really fun to play around with and they can be nice because you wouldn't have to resharpen the whole thing if you accidentally break the lead. So that is that. We're coming to the end of our class tonight. Are there any more questions before I head off? If there aren't, or if you think of any after the class has already ended, you can comment them in the chat on YouTube. Make sure you go below the video and actually put the comment underneath the video rather than in the live chat so that I can respond to it. On Facebook, I'll be able to come in and answer anything. Again, if you're on TikTok or Instagram, make sure you go to either Facebook or YouTube. I believe I messed that up. Anyway, either Facebook or YouTube if you would like to ask questions because we will not be able to answer them on Instagram or TikTok.
But yeah, thank you guys so much for coming tonight. I hope you had a good in-depth explanation of how to do this. Again, if you want to learn more about how to do this kind of stuff and how to draw things from your imagination, that intro to Illustration Jerry's Live that I did a while back and the perspective drawing classes that we have done are really going to be your bread and butter for this kind of stuff is if this is what excites you. Check us out next week. We're going to have Emmy back again for expressive pet portraiture. I know a lot of you guys really love seeing her little kitty nugget and her painting doing of that. So she's going to be wrapping that class up and showing you guys the next steps after the underpainting. So please check us out for that. And again, thank you guys so much for coming tonight. If you want to, one last thing I almost forgot. If you try anything like this, please post it to our Jerry's Live Facebook group. So many people post artwork there. A lot of people did stuff for Emmy's acrylic pet portrait pet portraiture class, which we love to see. I mean, love seeing all of that stuff. So thank you so much for posting it there. Just make sure if you want to join that you answer our security question. Otherwise we will deem you a robot and will not let you in. And yeah, thank you guys so much and bye. <laughs>